All right, we left off with Jesus sending the 12 apostles throughout Israel. And it says that he empowered them. He gave them his power uh, to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And And we saw that was because the king of the kingdom was in their midst. And they were going out in the power of the Lord, and it says that they were to uh, perform all these signs and wonders, uh, which was given to them for the purpose of proving that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. And the Messiah was there with them in Israel. After they left, uh, we saw last week two of John the Baptist's disciples come to Jesus, and they have a question for him. Are you the one... Or should we look for another? Are you the promised Messiah, or should we wait for somebody else? Now, why would John ask that? Because he's been sitting in prison for about 11 months at this point in time, and he's starting to wonder, hey, I'm the forerunner. I announced the coming of the Messiah, and things aren't going the way I hoped for, because he was thinking, like the Old Testament prophets, that the Messiah was going to come kick out the Romans, kick out God's enemies, and establish the kingdom of God on earth. But that's not why Jesus came 2,000 years ago. He came to die on the cross for our sins, the worst enemy of all. At a second coming, he will establish his kingdom on earth. So John's confused. He's like, what's going on here? Are you the one, or should we look for another? So Jesus tells these disciples of John, Um, let them know the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So he's telling the disciples, go let John know everything's going exactly according to the Father's plan. Everything is right in line with what the Old Testament has prophesied about the Messiah coming. And again, he was fulfilling Isaiah chapter 11, 35, and 61, these prophecies that looked forward to what the Messiah was going to do. So everything's coming together just as the Father had planned. And then Jesus tells the multitudes after the disciples leave um, that John has fulfilled everything that he was supposed to fulfill. In fact, John the Baptist was the greatest, Jesus says. He was the greatest of the prophets. Again, it's because the Old Testament prophets also prophesied about John the Baptist. And we looked at those verses last time. So G- John's the one who said, I must decrease, Jesus must increase. And so the Old Covenant is about to be replaced with the New Covenant. The New Covenant would be based on the blood of Jesus, the perfect Um, pure blood of the Messiah, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The Old Covenant was based on millions upon millions of animal sacrifices down through the centuries, yet Jesus' once and for all sacrifice and the shedding of his blood was the New Covenant. Remember when we uh, take communion, and as Jesus is instituting communion, he says, this cup is the New Covenant in my blood. So the New Covenant, it's based on his death, his burial, his resurrection. And so now as we come into chapter 11, verse 20, Jesus will begin to warn the people about clinging to the old covenant. And he's going to take this through the next few chapters. Um, He's going to say we need to start embracing this new covenant. And the bottom line is what Jesus is going to tell us is if you reject Jesus, you are rejecting God. If you reject Jesus, you're rejecting God's plan of salvation. And as we'll also see, without Jesus, there is no eternal rest. And that's the theme of what we're looking at this morning, is the eternal rest that we have in Christ. There is no eternal peace. There is no eternal joy without Jesus. There is only death and judgment. So verse 20 of Matthew 11, it starts off. It says, Then he, Jesus, began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done. Why? Because they did not repent. Now this has been an unfortunate thing throughout, I don't know, the last couple thousand years. Too many people just want to see miracles for the sake of seeing something miraculous or something extraordinary. God's purpose in bringing forth signs and wonders is not just to change somebody's physical body, because even when he raised people from the dead, guess what? They died later. 
Even when he healed somebody, they would then eventually get sick and die of something. The reason he gives signs and wonders is for the purpose of changing their hearts, drawing people to the Lord, helping them see who Christ is. In Matthew chapter 12, the religious leaders are going to come to Jesus and tell him, hey, we want to see a sign. We want to see a miracle from you. And Jesus rebukes them because they just wanted to see him perform. So he rebukes him and says, an evil and an adulterous generation seeks or craves after a sign. In other words, Jesus knew the hardness of their hearts. After all, he'd been doing miracle after miracle among them, and they're still doubting. Miracles do not change your heart. Jesus does. And so it's all about Jesus. And miracles are great. God still works, but it's always to point people to Jesus, not to uh, whoever God is using. Remember in the wilderness, as the Jews leave Egypt, well, that was pretty miraculous, the ten plagues God sent upon the Egyptians. They leave, there's the parting of the Red Sea, they go through on dry land, God brings the water back, destroys all of Pharaoh's army. They get on the other side, and then pretty soon, you know, he gives them manna from heaven, water from a rock. You know, every day it says he had a cloud, you know, a pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. Miracle every single day. They're only a week from Egypt to the promised land. So they get to the border of the promised land. And what does it say? They did not enter in because of their unbelief. Even though they saw miracle after miracle, it didn't change their hearts. And so be careful when it comes to signs and wonders. What Jesus wanted to see from the people was genuine repentance. They did not repent, he says here in verse 20. He wants to see people turn away from their sin, turn away from their wickedness, start trusting Jesus, start following Him. So this is why He rebukes these cities, and He'll mention them here in a moment, because these three cities He's going to mention is where most of His miracles took place, but they did not repent. And again, this is still true today. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed, when the truth of Christ is explained, and people still stay hard-hearted towards the Lord, eventually they will be rebuked by the Lord. So verse 21, he says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum or Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have been remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. So what an indictment against these three cities And these three cities are all around the Sea of Galilee. Apparently, Jesus did a lot of miracles in Chorazin and Bethsaida, but they're not really recorded in the Scriptures. Remember in John, at the end of his Gospel, he says, Jesus did so many other things that aren't written. You know, you could fill up the whole world with books about what Jesus did. So he did a lot of miracles in those cities. We know Capernaum, Capernaum, was his home base there on the Sea of Galilee. And he did miracle after miracle. We've already seen many of what he has done. He's opened up blind eyes. He's cast out demons. He's cleansed lepers. He's raised people from the dead. Multitudes were healed there. And so Jesus mentions the wicked Gentile cities of Tyre and Sidon, which are in Lebanon. They're present-day Lebanon as well. Um, He also mentions Sodom here, of Sodom and Gomorrah fame. Remember, God destroyed them fire and brimstone back in the book of Genesis because of their sin and wickedness. What Jesus is saying is if those wicked cities had been given the privilege of seeing what Jesus has been doing, if they would have seen the miracles that Jesus has been doing, they would have repented. He says it would have been more tolerable for them. They would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. They would have been spared. And so the point is, the greater the revelation God gives to people, the greater the light of Christ that shines upon people, the greater people are going to be held accountable and responsible for what they do with the light God has given them. Very important. 
It was after Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. The dove, the Holy Spirit, comes upon him. That's when his earthly ministry begins. First thing he does is go out in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights. He doesn't eat anything, and then Satan comes and tempts him. He has victory over the enemy. And then the very next thing that happens, we saw this earlier in Matthew chapter 4. Look at these verses, starting in verse 13. This is why Jesus held these cities accountable. He says, In leaving Nazareth, he came, to, uh, came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, the Sea of Galilee, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. Those are the two tribes of Israel that were in that region. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness, this is a prophecy about what Jesus did here, have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and in shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so here Jesus is rebuking Capernaum, and Chorazin, Bethsaida, because he, the great light of the world, has been among them, and yet they did not repent. They have not received Jesus as their Messiah, as their Lord. Here's an inter interesting side note. There are, and were, and are, four, well, there were, four major cities on the Sea of Galilee. These three mentioned Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. These three cities that Jesus pronounces this woe upon, you go to Israel. Capernaum is one of my favorite places to go, but guess what? All it is is archaeological ruins. There's never been anything rebuilt there. It's beautiful to see. There's only one city that's not mentioned here that was still going in Jesus' day, that's still going strong today on the Sea of Galilee. It's Tiberias. That's the only place where people live and dwell, and there's you know hotels. It's a beautiful spot. But he only cursed these three, and that, guess what? That prophecy was fulfilled. Nothing but ruins. By the way, do you really think our country will escape God's judgment and wrath? No way. We've been blessed by God in so many ways. For the last 250 years, we've had God's grace, His mercy, like never before. We've had the light of the gospel shining forth upon our country, like almost no other country in the world. And yet, today, every study that comes out, every um, poll that's taken, the numbers of true born-again Christians is dropping like a rock. I mean, it's very, very few people that truly believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. I quoted that a few weeks ago, where of those who claim to be born-again Christians, less than 50% even believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. Excuse me? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It's a pretty narrow road that we saw in chapter 7. Narrow is the road that leads to life. You were on that road. We stopped repenting as a nation, I think, back after 9-11, 20 years ago. That was our wake-up call. But ever since, we kind of roll over and hit the snooze button. The alarm has sounded, but we have since rejected the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's only a matter of time before we as a nation will be judged. But take heart, every nation but Israel will be judged in the last days. So it's not just us. We're not just the bad guy. Everybody's wicked in God's eyes unless they repent and turn to Christ. So great will be the destruction when the time comes. Well, look at verse 25. He says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes, you and me, little kids. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. So here Jesus stops and prays to the Father. It says, the Lord of heaven and earth. This simply means he is the creator of all things. He created everything visible and invisible. Throughout the whole universe, he spoke the word in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. The word created in the Hebrew is bara. It means to create something out of nothing. 
Only God can do that. Only God can create something out of nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In this prayer, Jesus is thanking the Father that the simple folks of the world are the ones who are understanding the truth of what he is saying to the people, including us. The hidden things that he mentions here, that he refers to, is that simple relationship that you and I can can enter into and have entered into through faith alone in Christ alone. It's the good news that we know that God is alive. He's overseeing His creation. He sent His only begotten Son from heaven to earth. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He paid the price in full. He was buried in the tomb, but He conquered the grave. This is the gospel. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 is all about. And because He rose from the dead, He can now give eternal life to anyone who will come to Him by faith. These things are hidden from the so-called wise people of the world. They're found only in God, but the only way anyone can ever discover them is through faith in Jesus Christ. This is also why the so-called wise people of the world cannot understand the things of God, because you can only discover these things by humbling yourself before the creator of the heavens and the earth, and admitting, God, I don't have a clue. I don't know what's that, you know, how you did it all. I, I just come to you as a little child, but I believe you are my heavenly Father. I believe you sent Jesus to die for me. And it's that simple faith in Christ. And we're like sheep in his flock. Jesus knows how to feed his sheep. He keeps it at ground level. Sheep don't climb trees. You know, the, the so-called wise people of this world, they're like giraffes. They get their long, stiff necks up in the clouds. And literally, they are just feeding off the high and lofty philosophies of the world. Jesus keeps it simple. In Psalms, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You're not going to find those things in the high, lofty things of philosophy. You're only going to find those in the simple truths of God's word that he keeps at ground level for us. Now, look at verse 27. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. And this is a pretty amazing verse here. Here we see the supremacy of Christ first and foremost. Notice he says here, all things have been delivered or given to me by my Father. In other words, God has all things in His hands. Jesus is in control over all things. He is sovereign over His creation. Look at these verses in Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17. The Apostle Paul writes about Jesus, For by Him, by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities, so you're talking about the spiritual realm there, or powers. All things were created, first of all, by Him, but also created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. In other words, Jesus is co-equal, co-eternal, co-creator with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And the Father and Son have had this perfect relationship throughout eternity. This is why Jesus can say here, no one knows the Father except the Son. No one knows the Son except the Father. And it's only through Jesus that we can know the true nature and character of God the Father. When you look at Jesus, how do you know what God is like? That's a universal question. Who is God? What is God like? Well, you have to come to Jesus because Jesus has given us the perfect picture of God the Father. You want to know what God the Father is like? You have to look and study Jesus as it's taught in the Word of God. Remember John 14. Look at these verses starting in verse 8. This is the night before Jesus is going to be crucified. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. In other words, come on, Jesus, just give us a little glimpse of God, and then we'll believe who you really are. Still didn't get it. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, 
show us the Father. In other words, you look at Jesus and you get the perfect representation, the perfect example, the perfect reflection of God the Father. In Hebrews 1 verse 3, it says of Jesus, He is the express image of God. That means, the express image means the exact image of God the Father. In other words, Jesus is saying He is God the Son and He represents God the Father perfectly to you and me. So again, you want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. Co-equal, co-eternal. If you don't know, or if you want to know what God is really like, you have to look at Christ. He alone has revealed the heart and the mind of God to us. This is the, the simple reason why nobody can know or nobody can understand God apart from being saved and brought into the family of God. Apart from Christ, you cannot know the Father. This is why Jesus also says this in John 5. Look at these verses, verse 22 and 23. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. So don't just picture Jesus, cute and cuddly, little baby in a manger. That's true. We'll, we'll look at that next month. But he's also the, la uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is coming back in power and great authority and glory. So he has committed all judgment to the Son that all, notice, all people should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So why is this so important to have the correct biblical understanding of who Jesus Christ is? Because if you dishonor Jesus, you are dishonoring the Father. How is Jesus dishonored among the people? By believing wrongly about who Jesus is. He's not a little genie in a bottle. You rub the magic lamp, poof, he'll give you whatever you want. Three wishes and it's all yours. No, that's not Jesus. That's not the biblical Jesus. And I use that term a lot. The biblical Jesus. He's not like the cults teach. He's not one who was created by the Father. You know, one cult says he's Michael the archangel. He's created by God, Jehovah. Another cult to our West says he's the spirit brother of Lucifer. And just as Jesus grew into godhood, all of you men, <laughs> if you join the right religion, you can grow into a godhood just like Jesus. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. When you teach wrongly about Jesus, you dishonor him. And Jesus says, if you dishonor me, you're dishonoring the Father who sent me. The Apostle John says it like this, 1 John 2, verse 22, Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed Messiah. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Let me give you an example. The Bible is very clear that Jesus is not only the only begotten Son of God, but He's also God the Son. John 1.1 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus is the Word. And the Word was God. You skip down to verse 12. It says, and The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him and without Him. Without Jesus, nothing was made that was made. And so that clearly tells us that the Word, Jesus, was and is God and that He created all things. Again, He's not a created being. He's not the spirit brother of Lucifer. Those things dishonor the deity and the glory of Jesus Christ. And if you mess up the truth of who Jesus is, you'll never be able to figure out the truth of who God is. And then you'll never know how to get saved. And you go in, I came out of a cult, and there's no way you can get saved in these cults because they always change the nature and character of who Jesus is. And without, the, without that proper understanding about sin, that we've all sinned, fall short of the glory of God, and salvation, that He alone is the Savior, then you'll miss out on salvation and forgiveness of sin because it becomes meaningless under these false religious ideas about Jesus. So again, knowing the truth about Jesus 
as he's revealed in the Bible, is so important for all of us because an unbiblical Jesus can never save a person from their sins. Because if I was created just like Jesus and Jesus worked his way into godhood, then they say you can work your way into godhood as well. So why did Jesus need to come? If I can do it, well, he just showed us the way. No, he didn't. He is the only way, truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father but through him. Notice what Jesus says at the end of verse 27. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. In other words, the only people who can know the Father are those whom Jesus desires or chooses to reveal the Father to. Now, before you think, well, that's not fair. He's going to just discard all these people and he's going to pick somebody like me. The next verse shows us Jesus gives a universal invitation to anyone who will humble themselves and come to him by faith. Here's how I see it when it comes to the sovereignty of God and the free will of men. The Bible teaches both. You can't deny it. God says, I chose you. You didn't choose me. The Bible also says you have to come to Christ for salvation. So which, which is it? It's both. Here's how I solve it in my own BB brain. Romans 8.29, For whom he foreknew. The word foreknew, foreknowledge, means God from eternity past. Since he's God, he's omniscient, all-knowing, he knows everything about everything, about everybody. He knows who's going to receive Christ, who's going to reject Christ. Based on that, he can choose you because he knows who's going to receive, who's going to reject. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So you and I, who are born again, will have many brethren, many brothers and sisters whom he will conform into the image and likeness of Jesus. Again, the Apostle John says in 1 John 3, verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God. If you're born again, you're a child of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so even though we're a ch child of God right now, you don't fully understand or comprehend that as far as you're not in a glorified state. There's some Christians that wrongly think, I'm perfect now. <laughs> it's like, really? Have you looked in the mirror lately? Come on. Have you looked in the mirror 20 years ago and now look in the mirror today? No, you're not perfect yet. We're in disintegration. The second law of thermodynamics is taking place all around us. That means you go from order to chaos. So anyway, in the next few verses, we get a glimpse of who Jesus is. Look at verse 28. Here's that invitation. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, these are some of the most famous and some of the most important verses in the New Testament for a lot of reasons. Again, he first of all says in verse 28, Come to me, all you. That's his invitation to anyone and everyone who's willing to come to Jesus. By the way, that word come means to hunger. It means to thirst. It means to believe and receive. How do I know that? Because it's used interchangeably when Jesus says things like this. Look at John 6, starting in verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me, so he's using come to him and believe in him interchangeably, he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I'll by no means cast out. So there it is. Calvinism, Arminianism solved in that verse. <laughs> and you're like, I don't get it. I, don't, I can't comprehend that. My BB brain cannot understand fully the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, but the Bible teaches both. I like the way Pastor Chuck used to say it. You know, sovereignty of God, free will of men, it's like railroad tracks going down the line. They're, they parallel each other, but 
The problem is when people try to cross them, then you, then you crash, and then you burn, and then you get frustrated. Well, how do I know I'm chosen? Well, did you receive Jesus? Did you come to Jesus? Yeah. Well, then I guess you're chosen. Well, what if I'm not chosen? Come to Jesus and receive Him as your Lord and Savior, and then you know He chose you. It's pretty simple. Don't, don't, don't overdo it. Don't overthink it. You'll make yourself nuts. The church of Laodicea. Here's Jesus' invitation to them. Revelation 3.20. It's not just for the church of Laodicea, but it's anyone in that church system. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is Jesus knocking on the door. If anyone, that means anybody, anyone, doesn't matter background, doesn't matter race, doesn't matter financial, it doesn't matter. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, so that's us coming to him, opening the door, he says, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Again, Jesus is inviting people to come to him. He's not inviting people to come to religion. He's not inviting you to come to a creed or to a church. He's inviting people to come to the living, risen Lord and Savior. And again, notice who this invitation goes out to. All you, back in verse 28, all you who labor and are heavy laden. That pretty much describes everybody in the world. If you recognize, man, I'm burdened down, I'm heavy laden, I'm being crushed by the stuff of this world. In other words, everybody who is not saved, what's the heaviest burden upon them? Sin. We're all being crushed. Without Jesus, you're being crushed by the heaviness, burdened down by sin. And the only remedy for your sin is the blood of Jesus. So when Jesus says here, come to me and I'll give you Rest, very important because he's speaking of eternal rest. Sabbath, that's what it means. Sabbath means rest. He says, I will give you rest. Now, why is he saying this? Because the very next two scenes in chapter 12, we'll talk about how Jesus is challenged by the Pharisees because they're saying, you're breaking the Sabbath. You're healing a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. Your, your disciples are picking grain on the Sabbath. You can't do that. No, you come to Jesus and he gives you eternal Sabbath rest. The Sabbath law was given specifically to the Jewish people by God. It was a covenant between God and Israel. It was supposed to be a time of rest. We'll look at this more detail next time, but they had... Well, you know, the fourth commandment, keep the Sabbath day, keep it holy. You know, and then there's like 613 laws dealing with the Ten Commandments. Well, the Jews added just to the Sabbath 39 laws. And then for 39 laws, they added to the Sabbath. For each one of those 39, they added 39 more. And so that's why it was a burden. They spent more time in fear that I'm going to break the Sabbath because the religion was hanging over them. They had stupid laws like, well, you can only walk so many feet on the Sabbath. And so a way they'd get around it is I'll tie a rope to my foot, a long rope, because I, it, as long as it's attached to the house, I can still walk that distance. And because I'm still part of the house, 100 yards away, then I can walk even further. And it was stupid, the things they came up with. I mean, it's amazing. 39 times 39 is what? I'm like John. I don't do so well in math. I don't know. It's like 1,500 laws they added to the Sabbath. This is why it was such a burden. All these rules, rituals, and regulations, it was a heavy burden, a heavy yoke on the people. Instead of finding peace and rest the way God intended for the Jewish people, all they found was burden. They lived in fear. Again, trying so hard not to break the hundreds and hundreds of Sabbath laws that they came up with. When people say, oh, you're breaking the Sabbath because you worship on Sunday, a great verse to show them is Romans chapter 14, verse 5, written by a former rabbi named Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul. He says, one person esteems one day above another. It's Saturday. No, it's Sunday. It's Saturday. No doesn't matter. 
Another esteems, here's what I've chosen to do, another esteems every day alike. In other words, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they're all great days to worship the Lord. They're all great days to rest in the Lord. They're all great days to praise His holy name and be in His word. He says, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. In other words, every day is a great day to seek the Lord and rest in Christ. Again, Jesus is the fulfillment of all the law and all the prophets. And that, that also is true of fulfilling all the laws concerning the Sabbath. He's fulfilled them all. When God gives the Sabbath, he's very clear. Again, he's writing these to the Jewish people. Look at these verses, Exodus 31, verse 13. You could call these proof texts if you need them. Speak also to, notice, the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you, the children of Israel, throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Skip a few verses down, Exodus 31, 16. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. The Sabbath was never intended to be for Gentiles. It's between God and the children of Israel forever. Look at these verses. This is what Paul says. And again, he was a very, very legalistic Jew before he got saved. Colossians 2, verse 16. Paul says, So let no one judge you in food. Hey, if you want to be on a kosher diet, praise the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. Don't let anybody judge you if you want to be on a kosher diet. Just don't judge me when I say, Eat pizza and die. <laughs> it's okay. You know, don't judge people based on their diet or in drink or regarding a festival that's referring to the feast day. Feast days are awesome. Jesus has fulfilled the feast days and he's about to fulfill some more feast days, but it's all about Jesus. So don't let anybody judge you if you're not celebrating a particular feast day or a new moon or Sabbath which are, here's the key, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So in view of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, Paul stressed the danger of going back to a legalistic relationship with God. That's why he says, let no one judge you in regard to these Jewish traditions and practices. As many of us can attest to, there are still a lot of people that will judge us. They try and convince other Christians that we're still bound by the Sabbath laws and all these other Old Testament laws. But as Paul just said, the Sabbath is a shadow of the eternal rest that we have in Jesus. So important. He's the substance of the Sabbath. He is our rest. I encourage you to read um, Hebrews chapter 4 because it goes through Jesus being our Sabbath rest and that the Jews could not enter into the rest because they rejected Jesus. But those who come to Christ enter into that eternal rest. Here's an example, Hebrews 4.10. It says, For he who has, who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. In other words, when God created everything in six days, it says he rested on the seventh day because he was tired. No, <laughs> he's God. He wasn't tired, but it was finished. His work was finished. That's why he rested. In the same way, we can also enter into the rest of the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. What was the last thing he said? Is he hanging on the cross? It is finished. To Tetelestai, paid in full. We rest in his finished work on the cross. He finished all the works that the Father required of Jesus while he was on earth. And the grand finale was being taking all of our sins upon himself, all the wrath and judgment we deserve for our sins. He took it upon himself as he hung on the cross and died in our place. And the price of his blood was paid in full. 
Listen, none of us could do enough good works to achieve our salvation, but we are completely, totally saved by His grace. And as far as our salvation is concerned, Jesus fulfilled every requirement of the Sabbath. And he has entered into perfect rest and peace. And so now, because we are in Christ, we experience perfect rest and peace in him. So again, as he says here in verse 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Again, that is what the vast majority of people in this world need right now. They need rest. They need peace in Jesus. Because there's such chaos, there's such unrest in the world around us. Look at the last two verses here in verse 29 again. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, when he's telling the multitudes these things, they know exactly what he's talking about. The yoke was the wooden harness that went across the shoulders of an animal that would plow the fields. It was a custom-made wooden harness that they would put on an ox or a donkey. They'd put ropes into it, and the ropes would go behind it to a plow, and then the guy plowing would stand behind it, and he'd follow it as that animal put all the weight on that yoke and went forward, driving that plow, pulling that plow through the field. Each yoke, again, was custom-made for each animal. And remember, Jesus grew up with his father-in-law, father his stepfather, Joseph, being a carpenter. And I can imagine Jesus making a lot of yokes for the farmers in and around Nazareth as they grew up. Again, if a yoke did not fit properly, this is why they had to be custom made. If, they did, if you took a big yoke, put it on a narrow-shouldered animal, as it pulled, it would start to rub, it would start to cut into the shoulder, it could bring infection, and if not treated, that animal would die because it was an improper yoke for that animal. That's why you needed a highly skilled carpenter to shape and carve the wooden yoke. It's like if you go get, you know, I've never done this, but some of you probably have gone to a tailor. <laughs> Had a custom-made suit made for you. And they're fitting you. And they're getting all the measurements just right. I think I did do it once, but it took like six months and I grew out of that suit. And it's, it's like, what a waste of time and money. Just buy something off the rack, just leave a little stretchy room in there and I'm good. <laughs> anyway, the context here is that you would be custom making, you bring the animal in and they would measure, they would cut, they would sand, they would shape that yoke to be just right for that animal. In the context of what Jesus is telling the multitudes of people here, the heavy yoke that they were wearing was the Jewish law. The people were laboring under the law. They were being burdened down by all the rules, rituals, regulations that the Pharisees put upon them and their interpretation of the law. The law is good, John, um, Paul tells us, if you use it lawfully. And they were using it in so many wrong ways. The people had no joy. They had no peace. They were being crushed and burdened down by the legalism of the day. So Jesus is inviting them, take my yoke upon you. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. That's how we know how Jesus likes his eggs. <laughs> Ugh, stupid. I knew I shouldn't have said that. It didn't work for a service either. <laughs> yoke over easy. Okay. Um, Jesus, Jesus has... Some of you are just now getting that? I'm so, wow. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Again, Jesus has a custom yoke fashioned just for you. It's easy. It's light because Jesus did all the work. In fact, he carried the ultimate yoke upon his shoulders as he carried the crossbeam 
upon his shoulders. They tied his hands around it, and they made him go through the city. He's plowing his way to Golgotha, to Calvary, to the place where they're going to crucify him. That's the heaviest yoke of all, not just the heaviness of the beam he's carrying, because when they nailed him to the cross, he's taking all the wrath and judgment upon himself that we deserve. He took the heaviness. He took it all upon himself. Amazing. In some strange but beautiful way, you and I are now yoked together with Jesus. But our yoke is easy. Our burden is light because he paid the price in full for us. Remember what Paul says, we believers, we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. In other words, we're not plowing and pulling in the same direction as unsaved people. Uh, it tells us in, um, uh, seeing out where it is, I think it's in one of the Psalms, it talks about you cannot plow with a donkey and an um, elephant. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, you guys didn't get that one either. Uh, donkey, elephant, political. Okay, can't pull in the same. No, the Bible says you can't plow with a donkey and a ox together because the the height difference. You know, so you get the big ox here, you get the little donkey there, and they'd be going in circles, never going anywhere. So they have to be equally yoked. You have the same animals pulling together. Second Corinthians 6, verses 14 and 15, Paul writes, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And this is why I don't do marriages between a believer and an unbeliever. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion or fellowship has light with darkness? And what accord or oneness has Christ with Belial? Or what part is a believer with an unbeliever? But we are yoked together with Jesus through the cross. And I think this is why Paul tells us in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. So when he was nailed to the cross, we were nailed there with him, spiritually speaking. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and it's him living in us. He's our strength. He's our power. He's the one that enables us to get through whatever problem, struggle, trial, tribulation we go through. That's why our yoke is easy. Our burden is light because Jesus did all the work for us. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so again, Jesus offers us the cross that is how we are yoked together with Christ. He says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And it's only because he did all the work for our salvation that he can tell us, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And the more we can understand that truth and believe that truth and live in that truth, the more rest we find, the more rest we will experience, the more joy we'll have in our relationship with the Lord because we know He did everything. He paid it all in full for us. And how do we come to know and live that truth? This is what Jesus says. Look at verse 29 again. Take my yoke and what? Learn from me. He is our ultimate teacher. He wants us to come to Him and learn from Him. Learn these truths from Him. And as most of us can testify, the more we learn of Jesus through the Word of God, the more we grow in our understanding of who He is and all that He has done for us. And the more we get to know Jesus, the more we can trust Him with every part of our life. We can trust Him through the difficult days, through the good days. We trust Him because we know He loves us. That's when our relationship keeps growing deeper and stronger as the years go by. I love how Paul encourages Timothy in this regard. 2 Timothy 3, 14, I'll close it here. But you, he's Paul talking to his beloved son in the faith, Timothy, but you must continue in the things which you have learned. Again, Jesus said, take my yoke and learn from me. And been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. For all you parents that have been teaching your kids the ways of the Lord, from 
being little and now they're getting older and they're grown ups. Maybe they have kids now. They're learning because they're hearing it from the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so if you want to learn from Jesus, if you want to learn of Jesus, I encourage you, I exhort you, get in the Word of God. Be in the Word of God. This book alone is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. This book alone is a light to our feet, a lamp to our path. This book alone is God's Word where He reveals His heart and His mind to His people. And so, if you're His disciple... Come to Jesus. For what? I'm saved. Come to Him for what you need today, for this coming week. You need His wisdom. You need His strength. You need His whatever. We don't know what's going to happen this week. So you need to come to Him. Whatever you're facing, whatever trial you're in, whatever struggle it might be, you come to Him, you get strength, you get encouragement, you get boldness, whatever you need. If you're not His disciple, come to Jesus because He loves you. Come to Jesus because He alone can wash all your sins away. Come to Jesus because He alone can give you everlasting, never-ending rest, Sabbath, eternal life in Him.